good to be back again with our uh, with our Sabbath school class. And um, this week we are in, in lesson eight of our of our study of the book of Deuteronomy, and the title of our lesson this week is to choose life. Choose life. And so as we always do, let's open with prayer first and then we'll begin the study of our lesson, okay? Our Father, again this morning, we thank you again, and we come before you again this morning, thanking you for the week of study that you've granted us. Last week when we left your house, we asked you to give us just another week of study and come back to praise and worship you. And God, we thank you for honoring our request. So bless our study today. In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So, um, <clears throat> choose life, and where, where, I'm, where I'm going to start today is at the, the, I'm going to start at the bottom of the page of Saturday. I'm going to get then go to our memory text. I'm then going to share just a few lines off of our um, off of our, our lesson there in number one, and then I want us to turn to First Corinthians, okay. 1 Corinthians, uh, chapter 10, okay, and we'll, we'll, we'll pick up in verse number 1. I want to make a point about our lesson, okay, this week. So as we start, I'm at the bottom of Saturday, okay, the last paragraph on Saturday. In the last paragraph, it says that this week, as we continue in Deuteronomy, we will look at the choice of life and the opportunity given us to choose life, to choose it on the terms that God, the giver and sustainer of life, has graciously offered us. That leads us up top to our memory text, and our memory text this week is taken from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. I'll make a comment about Deuteronomy chapter 30 in just a second. But you want to read our memory text for us? You have your, you have your recorder there or no? No. You don't. Okay, that's fine. Huh? Are there any answers? Oh, I do not know. I, I, I don't know. Somebody want to read our memory text for us? I call heaven and earth witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. May live. Okay. And so I'm at I'm on our I'm on our little handout right there. I'm at number one uh, that I that I gave earlier. And so at the top it says many times in Scripture there is judgment, and that judgment is then followed by hope. Israel failed and worshipped other gods, and God brought judgment as stated in His covenant. Now this week predominantly we are in chapter 30 of Deuteronomy. And so Moses in Deuteronomy 30 looked down through the centuries that were coming and he saw the future restoration of Israel in their land and under the blessings of God. So this week in chapter 30, in verse 1 to 10, it is God's promise of obedience and living. And in verse 11 to 20, it's our choice whether it's eternal life or eternal salvation. The lesson that we're studying here to the Israelites is the lesson to us today. When we studied our lesson, we can see how the message to the Israelites, it applied to us today. Everybody agree with that? Okay. And so how do we know that? Well, let's take and turn our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We'll open our lesson here, and then we'll go to Sunday. And I'm in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, verse 1, okay? And I'm reading from the NLT version of, of the Bible, okay? And in verse 1 it says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, and they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was who? It was Christ, right? Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples to us from setting our hearts on equal things as they did. So here is Paul reminding them 
that all that we see that happened to the, to the Israelites are what? They're examples for us here today, right? Yes. They're examples for us today to keep us from setting our heart on evil things as they did back then. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and they got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day, 23,000 of them died. We covered that earlier in our study of Deuteronomy. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. Verse 11, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings to who? To us, on whom the culmination of the ages has come. The culmination of the ages means what? That means this is kind of the pinnacle of the history of earth. So all of these things happen to come up to this peak where we all are now. The culmination of ages, meaning that we are close to the second coming of Jesus Christ. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. Verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what we can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry, and I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves. Decide for yourselves. Choose for yourself what I say. Okay? So here is Paul now telling us that what applied back then was just, what happened back then is just an example for us here today. So we see all the warnings that are given to the Israelites in our lesson this week, they do apply to us today. And so that's why we can say that the Bible is alive. It's not dead because what happened back then certainly applies to where we are today. Before we go to Sunday, any thoughts on our memory text or how our lesson sets up to what is God, to what God is saying to the Israelites through Moses? God is speaking directly to us today. Yes. Want to make a comment? Go ahead. Uh, that story about how the girl had put her put her hope in, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and it, it just made me think of uh, Proverbs where it says, uh, "There is a way that seems right." But the end of yes, is death. That's correct. Absolutely. Good point. Good point. Any any other any other thoughts on our memory text this week? I just thought it to me when it said, "Should you do this day who you will serve?" That's correct. That's correct. But my house is going to be good. Yes, uh, the house of that. That's right. That sounds like what Joshua twenty four fifteen, right? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So then, can we go? Can we go to Sunday then? So on Sunday, we're speaking about the tree of life, and tree of life, we must be in the book of Genesis. And we are in Genesis chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, 15 to 17, and Genesis 3, 22 and 23. One second, I want to I give someone um, uh, our notes that we're studying this week. Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? Uh, so our um, our question our question on um, on Sunday is in the following text what two options did God present to Adam in regard to his existence and before we do that before we get to our questions we see in the first three paragraphs above it says that none of us asked to be here did we. The second paragraph says that it was, the, it was the same for Adam and Eve. They no more chose to be created by God than did a leaf, a rock, or a mountain. We didn't choose to come into existence as rational free beings made in the image of God either. What, the, what God does offer us, however, is the choice to remain in existence, and that is to choose to have life, that's eternal life, in Him, which is what we can have because of Christ and His death on the cross. So as we read these texts, if somebody had a thought about how, how, how did, what, what did you answer, what, was, what were some of your thoughts in looking at these texts? We'll read a few of the texts, but what, what anybody want to offer what they, what they came up with? 
Go ahead, Marie. Uh, I, I have. But, uh, you have the, the choice of, um, you can choose from the uh, tree of life or the tree of uh, the knowledge of good and evil. Mm hmm. Okay. Anybody else, anybody else have any thoughts about what, what, what choice? What what the, what two options did God present to Adam and uh, to Adam in regard to his existence? Well, let's take a look here. Let's go to Genesis two eight and nine, and then we'll go to Genesis two fifteen to seventeen, and then we're going to finish out. We'll finish out with Genesis three twenty three, but we'll stop at three six. Okay. So in Genesis two eight and nine, are we there? Would somebody like to read for us? Or I can read? All right. Then the Lord God planted the garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man he had formed. He made all kinds of beautiful trees. Grew there, all beautiful trees grew there, and products grew fruit. In the middle of the garden stood the tree that gave life, and the tree that gives knowledge of what is good, and what is bad. Mm -hmm. And then you can go ahead and read verses 15 to 17 for us. Then the Lord God placed a man in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and guard it. He said to him, you may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. You must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day. Mm -hmm. All right, and so here, God is given Adam the choice to do what? Right, he's given him, he's given him the option to obey or disobey, and that's the choice between, as you said, what did you say, Rita? You said, that's life or to choose life or death. Okay, he told him, don't eat. Let's go to Genesis 3, 6, okay, before we get to 22 and 23. Genesis 3, 6 says that the woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it, and then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. So in 3, 6, what happens? God gave them the option to obey or disobey, but what happens in verse 6? She disobeys. That's correct. And now let's finish out with, with Genesis 3, 22 and 23. Do you still have that, Sister? Or, or, I have it. Sure, I have it. Not that you have it there, really. You want to read it? Uh -huh. Genesis 3, 22 and 23. Mm -hmm. Yes, Genesis 3, 22 and 23. Mm -hmm. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, if I can stop Lord, you right there, if I can stop you right there, just read it. Even after they have disobeyed, Adam seems to still have a choice, right? Because God says that they can still go and eat from this fruit, right? But if they ate from the fruit after they had sinned, that means that the eat the garden they would be contaminated with sin, right? Go ahead, sister so read, read read verse 23 for us, please. Yep. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. Absolutely. So it was obey or disobey, life or death, and we see that they disobeyed. And so because Adam and Eve, they disobeyed, then they chose life or death. What did they choose? They, cho they chose death, right? What kind of death? They chose a physical death, right? They chose a physical death, but did they serve? Did they did they experience another type of death? A spiritual death they did, right? Because God separated Himself from them, right? And He banished them from the garden, right? How long did Adam live? Anybody know? That's like 930 years. So they were banished a long time, a long time. Okay, after being after being placed out of the garden. So, uh, so, I, I, so, so I agree with our concept here. It was obey or disobey. They disobeyed, and because they disobeyed, they suffered a spiritual and a physical death. Right? Mm -hmm. 
right? That was the two options that God had presented to him with, right? Yes. Okay. If we go down the page a little bit more, it says, Thus, right from the start, the Bible presents us with just one of two options. Eternal life, which is what we, are, what we were originally supposed to have, and eternal death, which, is, which in a sense is really going back to the nothingness out of which we first came. Okay? Our question at the bottom of it, at the bottom says, think about this. By our daily choices, how are we opting either for life or death? How are we doing that? That's correct. But the theme of Sunday is what? Life. That's right. It's obey or disobey. It's life or death. The question is, is by our daily experiences, how are we opting either for life or death? Are we obeying? Or are we disobeying? We're choosing to be one or the other. That's correct. That's correct. So that seems to be the answer to the question that we would ask ourselves. Am I obeying God? Or am I disobeying God? Right? If we disobey, we know what we have to do. Confess, repent, and, and, and reestablish our relationship with Christ. We know that. But at the same time, our effort has to be in obeying, not deliberately disobeying God because we know that disobeying, we know where that's going to be. Because the key word in that, that's a liberty. Uh-huh. Because, you know, we know about it. And we know wrong. Uh-huh. Right. But right. if we choose the wrong to do it, we choose it to do it. Right. I, I just, I don't want to miss the, uh, the point that, for whatever reason, God didn't want us to have knowledge of evil. I find it very interesting. You know. we, we, we had good, but now he didn't want us to know anything about evil. But now we're seeing how it's, it's playing out in the world itself. Well, when I think of that, God obviously knows everything. God knows the corrupting power of evil. He knows just how corrupting sin is. And he didn't originally create us for that and for us to experience that. And so because in his, in his divine plan for us, he says, I'm going to opt you out of that. You won't have to come upside evil. You won't have to know sin. And you won't have to suffer the consequences of sin if you obey. And Adam and Eve didn't obey. Right. Any other thoughts on these questions or his thought? No? Alrighty, so then, um, if we then if we then go to if we then go to Monday, and we're speaking about no, 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 no middle ground. Well, the decision on the bottom of Sunday is probably, I think. Go ahead. Uh, think about by our daily choices, how we opt to either for life or for death. Yeah, that was a question that I posed. Right, and, and life is therefore already before us. Uh, choosing life means loving God, walking in God's way, choosing God's commandments. Choosing death means doing it your way. That's we exactly that. that's, the, that's the that's the that's the that's the exact sentiment that we uh, that we said here. Yeah. Life or death is synonymous with obedience mm -hmm. or disobedience, mm -hmm. right? And that's what you're that's what you're yeah, saying. And, and, and it's not just it's not just uh, our eyes or our hands that make us sin. It's what's in our heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's why part of our focus this this quarter has been circumcising what? Our heart. A spiritual circumcision. Good point, Rita. Anybody have any other thoughts on that before we on, on, on Sunday, before we leave Sunday? So again. The, the, the point of our lesson is a very, very dramatic point, okay? This is choose life. This is obey or disobey. This is eternal life or eternal death. Mm -hmm. How are you, Sister Father? I'm fine. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. Mm -hmm. Good morning. This is Sabbath. When we're talking about choosing God with our heart, most people think of our feelings and not our intellect. So we got to encourage them. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, no, it's a little When we think about choosing God, life and death with our heart, most people think about our feelings and right. not our intellect. 
Right. And we have to encourage people. It, it's, it's more about uh, a knowing, mm -hmm. a knowing when it comes to that. It's our mind that he's really uh, asking us to make those life and death choices or mm -hmm. uh, accept eternal life or eternal death. Absolutely. Thank you for your point. So then as we go to Monday, as we go to Monday, we're looking at no middle ground. And we've been given three, six, we have seven texts here on Monday. Uh, and the question is in the following text, what two options are presented? This is kind of a part two of, of, of where we were on Sunday. Uh, we, don't have, we, don't, we don't have to read all of them. Uh, but did anybody have any thoughts about what the theme of these texts are, the two options that are presented to us in their study of the lesson? Come on, Sister uh, Believe in God, uh, you shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay. And if you don't believe in God and if you operate in disobedience, uh, right. you're bringing death and destruction on yourself. Mm -hmm. All right. So you seem to be with John 3.16 there with your first answer. So let's take, let's take a look at John 3.16. Okay, let's read that. And then let's do this. Let's, let's read just a couple of, of, of the other ones, okay? If somebody would turn to Romans 8, verse 6, somebody would pull that one up. And then someone would pull up, um, let's pull up 1 John 5, 10 to 12, okay? And... I have another text that I'm going to add to our study this week. It's James. If somebody would pull up James chapter 1, verses 5 to 8. Oh, 1 John. Uh, uh, yeah, 1 John 5, and we're going to read 10 to 12. But first we'll start with John 3, 16. Uh, read it. Did you want to read that or want me to read it? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay, and your point, your point earlier, if you would just repeat your point in terms of what that scripture meant in your answer. God, I, I, I don't feel good. I'm, I'm, yeah, you look like you're struggling this morning. Are you I, be all right? Exactly, I'm struggling. Uh, uh, believe in God, and you should not perish, but have everlasting life. Uh, if you operate in self, you're bringing death and destruction upon yourself. Okay, I'll let you. I'll let you comment. I'll let you come in when you're ready, because I kind of lean on you to read. So, so you let me know when you're ready. All right. All right. And then we, we our second text we're going to look at is Romans chapter eight, verse six. So who had Romans eight six? I, I have that, and I. I'm sorry. Okay. So what's the what's the what's the point of the text there? Right. Right. So flesh leads to death. The Holy Spirit to to life. Exactly. So what are the, what are the following texts or the two options that are presented here? We're either speaking about eternal life or eternal death, right? Let's go, let, let's go to 1 John 5, verses 10 to 12. Who's reading that for us? I will. Uh-huh. 1 John 5, 10 mm -hmm. to 12. 10 to 12. Yes. Says, he that believeth on the Son of God has the witness in himself. He that believeth not God has made him a liar. Because he believed not the record that God gave of his son. Mm -hmm. And this is the record that God has given us to us eternal life. Mm -hmm. And this life is in his son. In mm -hmm. verse 12. Verse 12. Mm -hmm. He that has the son has life. And he that has not the son of God has not life. Okay, so Sister Paul, you're saying what? Those who believe in Christ have what? Have eternal life. Eternal life. That's correct. Without Christ, we have right. and, and, and also eternal death. We have to look at those who believe. Because some people say they have Jesus, but they don't believe in what Christ is in us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
And so then, the title, the title of Sunday is No Middle Ground, right? So that means that we've got to what? We've got to choose, right? We've got to either choose Christ, believe in Christ, or we don't believe in Christ. Let's see what James says about those people who are floundering around, okay? James chapter 1, verse 5. Is that, is that Sister Yulette, Sister Daniel? Yes. Good morning, how are you? Good morning, how are you? Okay. And so before she reads, this is why it's important for us. This is why we have to choose. Because the Bible tells us that we have to choose. And look what happens to us if we don't choose, if we're trying to straddle, if we're trying to straddle the fence. Go ahead, Sister Daniel. You said five through eight? Yes. James 1, 5 through 8. Mm -hmm. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally, and unbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavered is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Mm -hmm. For let him not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So that's telling us what? For those who are kind of over here, over here, over there, what's going to happen? Um, that they're going, to, they're going to go to hell. And one of the things that I like about it, Dr. Reed, is that at the beginning it says, if any of you lack wisdom, mm -hmm. let him ask of God. God has given us the opportunity to seek him to make sure that we don't fall. And we can never say that we did we failed because he was not available to us. Because he wants us to know that he wants us he wants us to be, be saved. So it tells us, even in the book of Romans, chapter one, verse one, that we have no excuse, no excuse. for not knowing God. That's the first chapter of Romans. We have no excuse. Because all around us, God is revealed himself. Yes. Okay. We used to say um, that and there's three classes of people. You have one that's on the Lord's side, those in the valley of decision, and those who are on the devil's side. So when that time comes, we're speaking of now. If you don't choose the Lord, you automatically go to the side of the devil because you didn't choose the Lord. Exactly. Good point. Good point. So any other thoughts about just how concrete this idea of, uh, just how concrete this is, no middle ground is for us as Christians. Yes, how how <clears throat> powerful and eye opening it is is when we fellowship one with another and some of our uh, sometimes we say, Well, I have a choice. Well, did you make it did we make our choice when we accepted Christ? And then people go back, Well, I'm gonna do it today, not do tomorrow, serve today, not serve tomorrow. So we have to look at this as we have to ask God to help us to be steadfast mm -hmm. in our choice to be in Christ. Good point. Thank you. Our question on Monday as we, as we go down to the bottom, it says, in the context of eternal life or eternal death, why is the biblical truth that hell is not burning and torturing people forever such a comforting truth? And what would it say about the character of God or eternal conscious torment truly the fate of the lost? Did anybody take a look at that question or did have a thought about that? Uh, yes. Go ahead. I, uh, that's one point where I really thank the Southern Day Adventist Church. It was one of the first things I learned that was really uh, mind opening for me, you know, mm -hmm. how. God is not going to just burn people forever and ever and ever. Mm -hmm. Even on this side of earth, we, we try in a human, humane way to avoid cruel and unusual punishment. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, we want to put that on God. Mm -hmm. And I just really thank the church for opening my eyes to that. That's not how he is. Absolutely. Let's open our Bible. First, I'm sorry, Second Thessalonians. Chapter 1, and let's look at just verse 5 through 9 very quickly, and then we'll move on. Okay? So we see here, the thought, the, the thought is, is that hell has images for us in terms of fire and burning, but we know that fire in the Bible is synonymous with what? With God's judgment, right? 
we saw that in Sodom and Gomorrah. We see that with Elijah when he was dealing with Ahab and Jezebel, right? So, so it says here, so, so it says, so, and so in hell then, what is worse than being in, in fire is the eternal separation from God and God's glory. That's, that's the difficulty. Let's look at uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5 to 9. If somebody has that they'd like to read for us, that seems to explain what we're, what we're talking about in this question. Somebody have it they'd like to read? 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 5 to 9. Okay, you want to read something, Apostle? Go ahead. 5, which is manifested, is that correct? Yes, in God, yes, that's correct. Which is manifested... Which is manifested, talking of the righteousness, judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing which God to recompense tribulations to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven, with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking mm -hmm. vengeance on them that know not God, mm -hmm. and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So if I can stop you right there, the NLT version in the Bible in verse 9 says that they will be punished with eternal destruction forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. Read verse 10, please. Uh, I'm sorry, I was at verse 9. I'm sorry, that's why I asked you to stop verse 9, okay? So we see here that there's a description of what uh, we will be separated from God and the glory of God, and that in itself is far more uh, impactful than any words that could be described to us, but we see that when we're speaking about God's judgment, the Bible uses terms like fire and the lake of fire. Go ahead, go quick and then we'll move So on. Elder, it goes back to the eight, them that know not God. Mm -hmm. So you're dealing with two classes of people that say they know God. Mm -hmm. But yet, in the end, the judgment is saying they do not God. They don't, they don't know God. And that, that, <laughs> mm -hmm. amen. Let's go to Tuesday. No further thoughts on Monday, right? Are we good with that? Let's go to Tuesday then, okay? And so, so on Tuesday, we now we're looking at life and good, death and evil, blessings and curses. And on Tuesday, we were in Deuteronomy chapter 30, and we're in verses 15 to 20. This says to us, what options are presented to ancient Israel, and how do these options reflect what we have seen throughout the Bible? And we are in Deuteronomy 30, verses 15 to 20. If somebody has verses 15 to 20 that they'd like to read, that's fine. Also, I have it and I can read, okay? Okay, go ahead, Sister Rita. Deuteronomy 30? Yes, and we're going to read 15 to 20. Am I coming to do it? Yeah, you're good. Mm -hmm. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil, mm -hmm. and that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments, and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the man, whither thou goest to possess it. Mm -hmm. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shall be drawn away, and worship other gods, and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that you shall surely perish, and that you shall not prolong your days upon the land, whither thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it. Verse 19 is our memory text this week. Uh -huh. Go ahead. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, and I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, mm -hmm. that both thou and thy seed may live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In verse 20. Mm -hmm. That thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life, 
and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swore unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. Okay. So again, this week we're ultimately speaking about what? Life or death. That's what we're speaking about in verses 15 and 20. In verse 15, it's life and death, and it's prosperity or disaster, right? In verse 16, it's love and obey and walk and live and multiply. In verse 18, it's disobey and be destroyed. In verse 19, it's life and death, it's blessings and curses. And in verse 20, it's love, obey, and dedicate yourselves, and you will live long in the promised land. In our second and third paragraph, it speaks to just what we have covered here on Tuesday, where it says, as although, I'm sorry, as all through the Bible, excuse me, there is no middle ground, no neutral place to be, they will, they will either serve the Lord and have life, or they will choose death, and it's the same for us as well. When we opened our lesson today, we said what? Our study of Deuteronomy 30, God is talking to the Israelites, but he's also talking to us, right to us today. That's correct. Okay, and so life, goodness, blessings, in contrast to what? It's death, evil, and curses, and in the end, though one justly could argue that God really offers them only the good, only life, and only blessings, but if they turn away from him, these bad things will be the natural result because they no longer have his special protection. However, we understand it, the people are presented with these options. It's very clear, too, the reality of their free will, their free choices. These verses, along with so much of the Bible, Old and New Testament, make no sense apart from the sacred gift of free will and free choice. We said when we first opened our lesson, it is the love of God that leads to our freedom, and then from freedom leads to choice. And then we have the option to either obey or to disobey. And that's, what, that's what's being said here. So in a real sense, the Lord said to them, Therefore, with the free will that I have given you, choose life, choose blessings, choose goodness, not death, evil, and curses. If you would take a look for me real quick on our paper that we handed out this week, I am on page 2, and I am in section B and section C. Okay? Three I'm on page two, B and C. So here, for those people who came in, anybody need a need a paper? How many people? Someone need Oh yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So. Okay, so in 3, B and C, that's dealing where we are on Tuesday, and we're in chapter 30, verses 11, 15 to 20, excuse me. And so the choice again was between life and death, right? Life and blessings, trusting in God and enjoying the bounties of the land, death and curses, that's idol worship, and curses in the covenant. Now today, as we've been talking, it was then, but it's also us today. For us today, it's eternal life or eternal death. We are now, it's now grace, not the law. Sister Rita taught that to us last week, did you not? I was, I had telepathy, I wasn't tuned in, I was out of town, but I know you taught that thing, right? All right, so God gave us the freedom to choose how we respond to him. If he forced us to love him, we would be robots. To give us no option but obedience would be a violation of our free will. Love is only love when it is voluntary. So we cannot love God unless we have the option of not loving him. Because God honors our autonomy, he will never force surrender or loyalty. However, there are consequences to either choice. Salvation is by the grace of God, or condemnation is by the righteousness of God. Choose life. Who has a thought on Tuesday? I do. Go ahead, Sister. Uh, Israel, like us, must cleave to God mm -hmm. and cleave 
Just think about that word to cleave. Mm -hmm. uh, follow, revere, keep his commandments. Follow, revere, guard, watch carefully, to obey and to believe. Mm -hmm. And the more we cleave, the more we, be, uh, we become like him. That's the work of the Spirit, right? To make us more Christ-like, right? Mm -hmm. Elder, Go ahead. Yes, in that to be more like him, it's, it's, it's actually... Pull your mask up. Him, oh, <laughs> you keep forgetting, that's right. It's actually um, him living now Christ-like more through us. Mm -hmm. We surrender, so God is, don't see us anymore. Mm -hmm. He actually sees Christ manifested, and it's it's like a relationship, a relationship you meet, and some go a little farther, and they begin to uh, love, mm -hmm. and that love go from receiving this person loves me to I love them, mm -hmm. and unless God's love is shown through us, we are not loving Him. And that's what it looks like on the outside. On the outside, it looks like cleaving to God is us becoming more like Him. That's what people see. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Jay, you want to make a point? No, my husband did, but we were looking for a microphone. Oh, we got plenty of mics in the house. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, we have she can take off the microphone. Oh, you got one? No. no re oh, yes, you're oh, Go ahead. Amen. Um, as I was listening to the evangelist, and I almost read around this section, because that's what Paul was talking about when in Romans 1, sorry, Romans 12, verse 1, he said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, mm -hmm. by the mercies of God. You can't do it by yourself. Mm -hmm. right. Before he even got to his point, he said, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Yeah. True That's the least you can do. True worship. True worship. Yes. Come on down. Yes. True worship. I say, so as the evangelist was talking, Sister Paul said, once you surrender and Christ comes inside of you, he takes over. Right. And everything that is done is because of him living his life. And the, the shout is, God the Father doesn't see us the same way anymore. Because now we are covered with the imputed and imparted righteousness of Christ. I heard a preacher say, when he looks at us, he sees us born in Bethlehem. Everything that Jesus did, that's what God sees us. Because now we are covered with the righteousness of God. Absolutely. That's amazing. Good point. Good that's point. Amazing. Good point. Yes, you can. It said, all true obedience comes from the heart. It was, it was hard work with Christ. And if we could sin, he was so identifying himself through our thoughts and aim, so blame, so blame our hearts and minds to our minds into confident conformity, I'm sorry, conformity to his will, mm -hmm. that when obeying him, we should be but carrying out our own impulse. The will we find and sanctify will find its highest delight in doing his service. When we know God as it is our privilege to know him, our lives will be a life of continual obedience through an appreciation of the character of Christ. Through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. Absolutely. Good point. Because that gets us to our question at the bottom of the page on Tuesday. Because the question at the bottom of the page says, what must Israel do in order to be faithful to the Lord? You just gave the answer to that. Somebody turn to Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. It asks us to focus on verse 20. But we see here in Deuteronomy 10, verse 12 and 13, it tells us what the Israelites had to do to be faithful to the Lord. And how do the same principles apply to us today? Deuteronomy 10, verse 12 and 13. Somebody have that they'd like to read for us? Mm -hmm. But you will have to obey him and keep all his laws mm -hmm. that are written in this book of his teaching. Mm -hmm. You will have to turn to him with all your heart. Mm -hmm. are, you reading, are you reading 10, 12, and 13? 
Uh, okay, uh, no, no, I'm sorry. Read Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Okay, there's no problem. I have it. I can read it. Okay, not unless somebody else has it. Go ahead, Brother Stewart. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Good. So, Brother Stewart's going to read verses uh, 10, I mean 12 and 13 for us. Go ahead. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart yes, and with all your soul, mm -hmm. and to keep the commandments mm -hmm. and statutes of the Lord, mm -hmm. which I am commanding you today for your good. For your good. So what, so what, that's right, for your good. So Brother Stewart is saying to us that there's five things that the Israelites had to do and there's five things that we've got to do, right? He first said fear. He says live or walk in the way of, 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 of Christ. He said love him. Serve him, as you said, um, uh, and and then obey all of his decrees and his commands. That's what the Israelites had to do, and that's what we have to do today. Okay? Dr. Reed. Yes, go ahead. All of that is surrounded by a love for God. You have to have a love for God in order to carry out these, these, these other things, to walk in all his ways, you know. Uh, to fear the Lord, you have to love God for that in, in, in order to, to, to carry out those commandments. Absolutely. You really do. Because if you don't love God, you know, you're going to walk in your own way and not in the way of God. And that was the point that I raised on Tuesday in C where we speak about if God just commanded for us to love him, then we would be robots. Mm -hmm. God respects our autonomy. Okay? So in that, in that God gives us the choice to love him or not to love him. But if we love him, then the desire and all these other things that we are speaking about, these other five aspects that we just spoke about, will then come out. They'll be a part of us. As Sister Rita was saying earlier, really, it becomes a part of our nature. And then that's what people see of us. Okay? Yes, Why? Because we have the Spirit of God working us. But Elder Kasupa said, when, when, when we come to believe in Christ, right? then what's God do? He sends the Holy Spirit into us. And then at that point, how does God see us? Does he see us as sinners? No. Nope. No, he sees us as covered with the righteousness of Christ. Right? Pretty much the same thing that we saw on the mercy seat, right? If God took the mercy seat off and he looked down into the, in, into the ark, what did he see? He, see all, he saw all the sins of Israel. When he puts, when he see, when he puts the mercy seat and there's the blood on the mercy seat, yes, what's he see? Yes. He sees the blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. So we're covered. Okay. Very good. Any 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 thoughts before we go then to, to, to Wednesday? Yes, go ahead. And that's what when we, we when we were in the book of Isaiah, Dr. Reed, what what Elder Stewart just talked about, that it all starts with love. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my command. Right. The, the the engine is your love for God, right? And when we were in Isaiah, Isaiah 29, 13, the Bible says, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as these people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, mm -hmm. and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of man. Mm -hmm. So he said, It is one thing for you to say it with your mouth, and you can go through all the routines and all of that, but where is your heart? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Where is your heart? If you do something, you have to do it out of love. So we, so we see we keep coming back to this concept of our sin nature and God telling us that our heart is going to need to be spiritually circumcised. It's going to have to be changed. When that happens, and I think that accentuates what you're saying for a moment ago, Brother Stuart, then we love God. Then we want to do these things that are told to us here in Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 and 13. Go ahead, you want to make a point? Yeah, if I may piggyback off of uh, Elder Kasuper, you know, love is an action word. Yes, right? it is. You know, we, we can speak it all day long. Yes, it is. But if we're not living it Say in it. our walk with Christ, mm -hmm. then it's devoid of, of any meaning. Yeah. So we have to we have to walk in this, this love. That's mm -hmm. right. So we know it but we're not applying it. Yes, what we know, we have to apply it to our life. And when we apply it to our life, then our life changes. 
Let's go on to Wednesday, okay? Because I want to make a point on Wednesday. On Wednesday, we're in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 to 10, and it says, it's not too hard for you. And in these 10 verses, it says, what are the promises given to them by God, despite the fact that this section is talking about what would happen if they disobeyed? For the sake of time, I'm going to kind of just, I'm going to try to just truncate that a little bit and, and so, so we can uh, get, get to the second question. And so what are the promises that were given to them by God? Well, in verses 1 to 10, we see in verses 2 and 3 that if you return through false worship, then your fortunes will be restored. In verses 3, 4, and 5, God would regather them from the ends of the earth, and he would give you the land that was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In verse 6, God will change your hearts and the hearts of your descendants. That's speaking about, again, the circumcision of your heart. Verse 7, he's going to curse your enemies. Verse 8 and 9, if you obey God, God will make you successful. And then in verse 10, if you obey God, God will delight in you. So these are the promises that are made to us in, uh, in Deuteronomy 30, 1 to 10. I want to take a quick look at our handout in number 2, okay? Because... <clears throat> As a matter of fact, you know what, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I, I'll, I'll just kind of just refer to this. You can read this, at, you know, at, at some point, hopefully, during, later today. But again, on Wednesday, it says, there are just four key words in chapter 30. It's heart, it's commandment, return, and life, okay? And so if God's people turn from their sins, they return with their hearts to God and his commandments and obey him, that they would enjoy life as only God can give. Moses is looking at a time when Israel, which is a chastened nation, will repent and and come back to God. Well, we know to some extent that that happened after the Babylonian um, uh, captivity for 70 years. But the fulfillment of this promise is not going to take place until the end of time. <clears throat> There's only 6 million Jews that are in Israel now, and many of them are scattered throughout the world. But God promises to, to regather his people and bring them together on the land and bless them. But in verse 6, as we said just a moment ago, First, a spiritual operation must occur, and that's a circumcision of the heart. And so that they then would receive the Messiah, that they would love their Lord, and then experience the spiritual life that God had promised them. What God is telling us, what the Bible is telling us from Philippians chapter 2, verses 8 to 11, tells us that every knee is going to bow. Yes. Every tongue is going to do what? Yes. It's going to acknowledge yes. that Jesus Christ is Lord. Yes, sir. To the glory of who? The Father. To the glory of the Father. Mm -hmm. So, that gets us to our second question. And what does this teach us about God's grace? God's grace. What does that teach us about God's grace? God's grace is sufficient. It's sufficient. Okay. That's, 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 uh, that, that's, that's good. That's from 2 Corinthians 12, 9, right? Yes. All right. Let's do this here. Someone turn to Romans. Yeah, Someone. It's go sufficient ahead. for those who love. For his grace is sufficient for who? Absolutely. For those who love him. Right. So we have to bring that out because some people, it has been said that everyone has grace, whether they are a saint or a sinner, mm -hmm. if they accept the commandments of God or not. And we have to, um, again, Empower people to know what the Bible is really saying. That's why I ask the question. All right. Someone, someone read Romans 5, 20 and 21 for me. And then I'm going to go to another text, John chapter 1, 15 to 17. Okay? Who has Romans 5, 20 and 21? I do. Go ahead, please, Sister Daniel. Romans 5, 20 and 21. 20 and 21. Mm -hmm. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abound, grace did much more abound. Mm -hmm. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through the righteousness mm -hmm. unto eternal life mm -hmm. by Jesus Christ our Lord. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that tells us that as, that as, as sin as sin grew, yes. grace grew more. Yes. Let's look at John chapter 1, verses 15 to 17. If anybody's got the Amplified Bible, turn this version on. Okay, verse 15. 
John chapter 1, verse 15 to 17. Now we're speaking about grace. What does this teach us about God's grace? In verse 15, John testified, this is John the Baptist, testified repeatedly, and again I'm reading from the Amplified Bible, about him, have, uh, about him and has cried out testifying officially for the record with validity and relevance, and relevance, excuse me, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I and has priority over me, for he existed before me. Verse 16, for out of his fullness, that is the superabundance of his grace and truth, we have all received grace upon grace, spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing, and favor upon favor, yes, and gift heaped upon gift. Verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, but grace, the, un the unearned, undeserved favor of God mm -hmm. and truth mm -hmm. came through yeah. Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So God not, only, not, God not only gives grace, mm -hmm. he adds grace on top of his grace. How does he do that? That, that I, was, I, I read this. I couldn't wait to get here this yes, morning. Sir. Just for this text. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How do you add grace uh -huh. on top of God's grace? Yes, sir. I don't know. Yes. God knows. Only God can do it. Only God. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody have a point they'd like to make? Yeah, go ahead. Well, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I know you were not here last week, but Sister Rita can attest to this. We talked about that grace that Elder Daniel just read from, mm. from Romans 5. And, and it, we say, God's grace, that at least I can say this, mm -hmm. God's grace does not make sense. It just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> if you can explain it to me, please do. But for me, God's grace does not make any sense. He is amazing. You got one bucket of sin, God said, I got five buckets of grace. You bring him five buckets of sin, he said, I got ten buckets of grace. That's it is why, just mind blowing. That's why I love the amplified version of the Bible. Because without that, it would not tell you that God adds grace on top of grace. Favor upon favor. Yes. yes. Gifts yes. upon gifts. Yes. And, and if we can read ja uh, Psalm chapter 5, Dr. Reed. Psalm chapter 5, verse 12. I'm going to do this and. And, and, and get happy all by myself. Mm -hmm. Yes, Lord. Brother Richard, I'm going to get happy all by myself, Brother Richard. You're reading from, you said Psalm? Psalm chapter 5, verse 12. That's the last verse in, in, in that chapter. Go ahead. I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. I don't know what caught, caught hold of you, Doctor, because I was planning to read on the Amplified Bible today. <laughs> and here's what the Bible said. Psalm 5, verse 12. For you, O Lord, Bless the righteous man, the one who is in right standing with you. That's what uh, the evangelist was talking about over there. Mm -hmm. And then he says, you surround him or her with favor mm -hmm. yes. as a shield. Mm -hmm. wow. Oh, you're missing your shout cue. Mm -hmm. I ain't preaching yet, but I'm happy already. Mm -hmm. Listen, God says he will surround the righteous. Yeah. Uh, I gotta stand up for this. <laughs> Forgive me. I'm happy. I'm happy. Oh my God. God says, when I when I surround my children with favor, you can get all around yourself. And all around is a shield of faith. How do you top that? I look at the president on the television. He got secret service around him. You can't get to, to, listen, you may not like Joe Biden or Trump for that matter. <laughs> I like Joe. But, but the point is, <laughs> he's surrounded with some folk. But you can't get to him. Chaplain Black used to come down here when he was in the Navy, when he was still a rear admiral with two stars. You couldn't get to Chaplain Black without a brother around him say, wait a minute, can I help you? Mm -hmm. Because he had a bodyguard. Yes. God says, I got something better than that. I'm surrounding my children yes. with favor Hallelujah. as a shield. And favor is not fair. And favor doesn't make sense. When you don't deserve something, God said, here, I'm just going to give it to you. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Woo. 
And I'll add a little something. To yes, sir. I'll put a little something on top. Yes, sir. Of that. Absolutely. Yes, sir. That's awesome. As we go to finish out Wednesday, then what I'm going to do is that the, 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 the basic promise here that we're speaking about is again, obey in the it's a choice between life and death. What they're asking for us in our last question is in the New Testament, in the New Testament, for us to look at a text that reflects this same principle that we see here being espoused to in Deuteronomy. I have a text, if somebody would like, if somebody would pull this up, they can read for us. And then if anybody else had another text that correlates Deuteronomy to the New Testament, we can do that. Somebody pulled up John chapter 3, verse 35 and 36. Brother Stewart, you want to pull that up for me? I got you. John 3, 35 and 36. Did anybody have another text where they correlated? Go ahead, Richard. Uh, when I did that, I, uh, James uh, 1, 22 came to me immediately. But, okay, go ahead, read for But me. be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Mm. Good comment. Good comment. So we're looking at so we're looking at obedience and life, disobedience and death. Brother Stewart, are you going to read, James, are you going to read uh, John 3, 35 and 36 for us? Yes, sir. Amplified version. Yes. The Father loves the Son and has given him and entrusted all things into his hand. Yes. He who believes and trusts in the Son and accepts him as Savior has eternal life. Yes. That is, already possesses it. But he who does not believe the Son and chooses to reject him, disobeying him, and denying him as Savior, will not see eternal life. But instead, the wrath of God hangs over him. Continue. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sister Paul, I think that's just what you were saying earlier. Is that correct? You were talking about us believing in God and believe in Christ, then, then we have access to eternal souls. If we don't, then as Brother Stewart just, just read here, we see that we come under the wrath and judgment of God. Okay? Any thoughts on that? Let's go, to, let's go to finish out Thursday. And on Thursday, we're talking about a question of worship. Okay? And so, we are, <clears throat> we, have, we, we have several texts in Deuteronomy from 4 to, to 30.17. We're getting a little short on time. So I'd like for someone, if they would just pull up Deuteronomy 30, verse 17, what's the common warning in these texts? When we read all these texts, what was the warning in these texts this week? What was it, what was it warning us about? That's correct. So what Sister Rita said is worshiping false gods. Somebody read Deuteronomy 30, 17. You got, did you have a point you want to make, Mary? No? Somebody read Deuteronomy 30, 17 for me. And then I'd like somebody to pull up Exodus 32, 7 to 9. Because our second question is, is why was this warning so essential to Israel? Okay? So, so Deuteronomy 30, 17, would you read that for us? But if thy heart turn away from the way, so that thou wilt not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them. Mm. So this is, speaking, this is speaking here about false worship. The question is, is why is the warning so essential, so essential to Israel? Who has Exodus? Yeah, please, go ahead. Please. I denounce you, I denounce unto you this day. Mm -hmm that you shall surely perish, mm -hmm. and that you shall not prolong your days upon the land, mm -hmm. whether thou will pass it over Jordan to go to possess it. Okay. So 17 warns us about false worship, and then God says to us that if you disobey, then you're going to be what? You're going to be destroyed. So why was this warning so essential to the Israelites? Who has Exodus 32, verses 7 to 9? Go ahead. Go ahead, Sister Rita. Yes. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people which thou broughtest 
out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Mm -hmm. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. Mm -hmm. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, mm -hmm. and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. Mm -hmm. Verse 9 says, I have seen how stubborn and rebellious these people are. Mm -hmm. These are some difficult people. So why why was this? And they were and they were kind of they were kind of inclined to not tell the truth, right? Because they, they took and they, they they threw that gold in that fire and then somebody said, A cow jumped out. Yeah, yeah. Right? It just leaped out. Yeah. It just came out. Yeah. Right? That's Aaron talk. That's Aaron talk. <laughs> Moses didn't believe me, right? But he said, that's what happened, right? <laughs> he said, I'll try it, right? So why was this so why was this so essential? Because God knew who he was dealing with. He knew that they were rebellious, they were stubborn. And what we see back then, do we see now? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. So we can see the picture of us throughout this lesson all week long. Go ahead. For me in that section, it was like he's constantly telling us that the things of this world will draw you away from. Mm -hmm. You will be drawn away, drawn away, drawn away. Mm -hmm. It may look good, it mm -hmm. may sound good, it may taste good, but if you let it draw you away from it, you're going to have consequences. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it may even seem seem innocent, uh, just a little bit of truth. What, did you, what, did, what, what, what was the text that you read when we first opened our lesson today? You said, the way may seem uh, right. 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 But in the end, it is death. That is correct. Let's finish out our lesson this morning. And we are in our, 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 our third and fourth question is, how is worship presented in these two, in these two texts? Revelation 13, 1 to 15, and then Revelation 14, 6 to 12. And what's the warning in Revelation and Deuteronomy? So we're going to truncate this a little bit. If somebody would turn to Revelation 13, verse 4. Revelation 13, 4, and then Revelation 14, um, Revelation 14, verse 7, okay? So, how is worship presented in Revelation 13, verse 4? Somebody have that for us? I can read it. Go ahead. Revelation 13, 4, go ahead. And they worship the dragon. For he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? Okay, so here we're speaking of false worship, right? Mm -hmm. Revelation 14, verse 7. Uh, you, 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 can, you, can you get to that and go to it? Yes, sir. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, mm -hmm. because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. So we see here, this is true worship, right? Mm -hmm. So we have a contrast between false worship and then true worship. So as we finish this, we're talking about the consequences of obedience and disobedience, right? Let's stay right there in Revelation, verse chapter 14, verse 9 to 11. Let's see what the consequences of or disobeying disobedience. You want to read that for us, Brother Stewart? 14, 9 to 11. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger and he will be tormented with fire and suffer in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Mm -hmm. Verse 11. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night. These worshipers of the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. So here, this is the result of false worship, okay? Let's continue, Brother Stewart, if we read verses 12 and 13, 
because we finished this out with the results of the result of obeying God in true worship. Okay? Verse 12 and 13, please. Here's a call for the endurance of the saints. Those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. Absolutely. So here we have a contrast here as we finish our lesson. Of obedience in eternal life, disobedience in the judgment of God. Our lesson draws that out very, 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 very succinctly this week. Somebody have a point? Just read you one next point. I'll show you. Oh, oh. Go ahead. I was just, I was just thinking to myself. Uh, just the things, just the things in the world today, uh, like the gospel shows and the movies, and even the the, the music in uh, the in the artist that comes out, and they're mixing uh, hip hop uh, with with gospel. Uh, Kirk Franklin with Rance Allen. All of them. All of that stuff, we we just we just need to watch and pray, uh, because it seems innocent, but it's just taking so many people away from the truth. Absolutely, and so that then leads us. Go ahead, Sister Chicago. You want to make a point, and then I'm going to close. I, with... I want to make a reading because we're talking about choices here, mm -hmm. and our choices. A lot of people feel that. Take your mask down. <laughs> Thank you. A lot of we talk about choices, and a lot of people feel that when Jesus comes. I'll make my last choice. I do up to that time. In our devotional book, um, <clears throat> his names, I'm just going to read this first paragraph for a second. We believe without a doubt that Christ is soon coming. This is not a, fa fa a fable to us. It is reality. When he comes, he is not to, he is not to cleanse us of our sins to remove from us the defects of our character, or to cure us of the infirmities of our tem temples and dispositions. If wrought for us at all, this work will be accomplished before that time. When the Lord comes, those who are holy will be holy still. Those who have preserved their bodies and spirits in holiness is in sanctification and honor will then receive the finishing touch of immortality. But those who are unjust, unsanctified, and filthy will remain so forever. No work will be done for them to remove their defects or giving them holy character. The refiner, Jesus, does not then sit to pursue his, his refining process and remove their sins and their corruption. This is all to be done in these hours of probation. It is now that this work is to be accomplished in us. That is correct. No and, that's, and, and that's where we started our lesson in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We said that all these things were examples for us so that we would change. Because now we are in the culmination of the ages. Now we are we have plateaued at this point just before the second coming of Christ. So as you said, time is running out. And once Christ comes, there is no time. Um, oh, go ahead. I just wanted to add it too that uh, because of the love of Christ, he doesn't force us to love him. He doesn't force us to choose him. Exactly. If we choose him because we love him. Right. And the adversary is just the, the opposite of him. He forces us to, you know, to worship him. Right. So, you know, God's attraction to us is, is his love. Absolutely, absolutely. Let's finish out our last question so we can close out this morning. It says, how can we make sure that even suddenly we are not slowly leaving our allegiance to Jesus for some other God? And so this speaks about false worship. And this speaks about us putting in place in our lives idol worship, right? And so it doesn't always have to be some statue or something like that, right? It can be a lot of things, right? It can be a car. It can be money. It can be fame. It can be any of these things. Anything that we put in the center of our life that displaces God from the center of our life is false worship. That's like God worship. Right? So this tells us to be certain to us for us to examine our life and make sure that we don't have anything that's in our life that is actually displacing God 
from the center of our life. Powerful lesson this week. Um, any final thoughts, 30 seconds before we go? Well, thanks, every, thank every, thanks to everyone for their participation this week. I, mean, I would just say we lesson. need Christ within us to do this work. And if we feel that we're being justified because we go down a list of commands, we're, we're really considering chief grace. But if we believe that Christ in us, and that is the power of grace that is doing the work of us being living in obedience to the commands of God, mm -hmm. and not just the team. Very good. Well said. Let's close out in prayer this morning, okay? Well, Father, we want to thank you again this morning for this, this awesome lesson this week, all the participation that we had. We, we, we trust and pray, God, that those who are here will come back next week, God, because you promised us another powerful week of study as we work our way through the book of Deuteronomy. Bless the service, the remaining part of our service today, our, our noon hour, and bless those who were here, those who were not here, but would have liked to have been here or those on their way, God, bless them as well. Forgive us and keep us, God, in Jesus' name we pray.